welcome on the first day uh, um, about the trip, uh, uh, about this workshop. Uh, I welcome Professor Jerome Vlave. Uh, uh, he's a well-known face in the, con uh, in the te tectonic geomorphology and uh, one of the most respected uh, geomorphologists in the area. Uh, his work uh, we, have, uh, we have followed many times. Uh, his landmark work on the, on the river terraces of the Bagmati River and the, uh, yeah, and the estimation of uplift rate. It is a path, path breaking work which has been followed later on. Now we have the uplift rate along, all along, along the HFT which have been followed. And uh, uh, that was his PhD work. And after that, uh, uh, yeah, Professor Mlave for uh, uh, worked on the sediment dynamics, uh, uh, yeah, erodibility estimation, and then application of these data in the modeling work. So for the first national workshop on the cotton, uh, uh, on this uh, quantitative geomorphology, we requested him. And we are glad and we are thank thankful you kindly agreed uh, uh, to be with us. And for next five, five days, Professor Lave will be with, with you. I would like to use this time so uh, you interact him well and uh, you can ask question uh, yeah, any times and uh, uh, it is more, more, like a, uh, more like a teaching session. And today we will start with a basic thing that uh, uh, what are the things going on in, yeah, in this area, why these quantifications are needed and after that it will move towards the uh, yeah, analysis of the long, long profile of the data. So, uh, so I invite yeah, Professor Lave. Uh, I'm very pleased to, to be here, to, to have been invited by Vikrant to uh, provide you a few lessons I have learned during many years uh, working in the Himalaya uh, in the mountains. And uh, first of all, don't hesitate to interrupt me, ask questions. Uh, to get some kind of uh, vivid interaction. And uh, if because of my pronunciation or because of I'm using some variable you don't understand or whatever, again, don't hesitate to interrupt me and, and ask precision. Okay, so today I will be uh, speaking mostly about uh, erosion issue and fluvial erosion issue. And before that, I will uh, provide a short introduction to why we are interested or why, uh, why I'm interested in working uh, on the uh, erosion of the mountains and more generally on the landscape. So what, why the study uh, of erosion is, uh, is important in earth science? Why for me, uh, quantifying surface processes is fundamental. There are several answers, and depending from uh, which where the place you are, you can have different answer, depending if you are geomorphologist, tectonicians, sedimentologist, or more uh, involved in resource uh, issues or seismic uh, natural hazard. So surface processes, as you know, shape the landscape, of continental surface. So this is the question in some way at the heart of geomorphology. And as being a geomorphologist, all questions related to uh, earth surface evolution are interesting me. Then for the last, I would say uh, 20, 25 years, um, there was a growing uh, question about the interaction between exogenous and endogenous processes. I mean, between uh, forcing from the atmosphere through climate on the Earth's surface and forcing, uh, forcing from inside from the uh, mantle dynamics uh, resulting in tectonic deformation of the crust. And uh, people have proposed that there is some interaction between climate, erosion, topography, and tectonics that makes that surface processes can, that uh, surface topography can evolve one way or another way. Um, we will see also, that's uh, one of my topics, that uh, looking at landscape, understanding uh, the shapes of the landscape, can be 
the hill slope can be the river profiles. We'll see the, those different uh, uh, issues. Understanding the geometry of a subject, we can learn something uh, from the uh, uplift uh, of the uh, upper crust from behind. So it's some kind of uh, view on uh, deeper processes. Uh, many people, sedimentologists, paleoclimatologists, paleoenvironmentalists, uh, environmentalists, uh, work on sediment archives to try to get a view on past processes, on past uh, history of Earth. And when you say sediments, it means that in most cases, except it's chemical um, uh, sediments, but for most sediments, they are coming, there are particles coming from a continental surface and particles that were, were eroded from the earth surface. So if we want to well understand what makes the sediment archives, how they uh, can evolve from the place where they were eroded down to the place where they were sedimented, then it's important to understand all the surface processes of erosion and sediment transport. And finally, in terms of economic and social reasons, so I will show you in the next five days and probably on the fourth uh, day uh, during the uh, conference at six o'clock, some uh, obvious uh, point about the strong uh, natural hazard that uh, makes um, the question uh, associated to natural hazard with surface processes. And there are also question about resources. It can be for sun resources, but it can be also for more uh, metallic resources uh, through the fact that many uh, supergen concentration is due to weathering and surface processes. And there are other questions about, for example, for river evolution, about life habitat for fishes, and we can enumerate quite longly. So first questions, so I make uh, in the next 30 minutes a quick review of these different points I mentioned. Uh, so first issue, the surface processes shape the surf, uh, continental surface. So just as a matter of uh, showing that, we can compare the topography of Mars and the topography of Earth. So it's a, a valley in the Himalaya. And you see that on Mars, clearly, well, during, uh, I think, Esperian times, so four to 3.5 billion years ago, there was a little of water on Mars and a little of erosion. So I think it's a view of the, um, one of the big canyon on Mars. But most of the surface is and eroded, and you can just see the marks of the, uh, uh, the craters of the meteorites. So you can see that without erosion, without surface processes, then the surface almost stay pristine without, uh, without resurfacing. And by contrast, in this Himalayan landscape with very active erosion and also with uh, tectonics, then you see that you create relief. So relief, what is it? It's valley, it's crest, so it's creation of differential uh, elevation between the crest and the valley. So very rugged uh, topography as different from the relief of Mars. So next, next issue, the points I was mentioning about coupling between the uh, external processes and internal processes. So tectonics build topography, thickening the upper crust, and erosion through uh, climate and precipitation destroy uh, the topography or try to destroy the topography and carve the valley. But in fact, as I was saying, there is some kind of loop or retroaction between these different uh, processes. And it's important to understand these surface processes how they are sensitive to topography, how they are sensitive to climate, to understand how they control, finally, the evolution of mountain range.
So for example, this is a result of uh, thermomechanical modeling. So in this kind of uh, modeling, you have upper crust which is shortened and you can see some kind of mountain wedge or mountain prisms which, is, uh, which begin to be built by the shortening. So on this view, on the uh, strain rate, finite uh, strain, you can see that you have mostly two uh, main faults uh, and thickening and you can see that you, ca uh, you can begin to see some small plateau that begins to build on top of this uh, shortened range. And if you keep on the shortening for million and million years, then you can see that after 6, 12, 18 million years, then you begin by, uh, by building a triangular uh, topography, and then after some time, around 20 million years, because of thermal weakening of the heart of the mountain, you begin to spread the mountain. So a mountain begins to gain some elevation, and after some time it reach some limit, mechanical limit, that makes you create a plateau that spread, that spread out. So this is what we can get without erosion at Earth's surface if we have just tectonics. In its well-known uh, paper and from Beaumont in 2000, it just compare with the same mechanical modeling what you get if you have uh, no erosion and if you get, uh, what you get if you have total erosion of the material. So you can see that once, uh, if you add uh, erosion to the previous case, uh, as soon as you get material arriving at the surface, it is eroded away and it prevents the mountain wedge to build and to expand laterally. You still have concentration of the deformation in the same triangular uh, fault and back fault. And in fact, erosion will prevent thickening and will prevent spreading or lateral spreading of your plateau. So you can see that having erosion or no erosion will completely affect the final shape of your uh, orogen. In one case, you will get some orogenic plateau. In one case, you will get just a narrow, uh, a narrow uh, mountain range. Obviously, this is just a numerical result, and in particular, it's quite uh, uh, schematic in the sense that all the material is eroded. Of, of, uh, in nature, obviously, we are in intermediate uh, situation, and there is always uh, some topography remaining. So we can ask, in nature, are there some case study where in fact, all the erosion can strip away uh, what is uh, coming from tectonics. And this is the case uh, probably in the uh, Southern Alps of New Zealand. So some estimate has been done of the tectonic flux. So knowing the convergence rate, knowing the uh, thickness of the crust, it was possible to estimate that the tectonic flux is around 700 uh, billions of kilo per year. And by measuring uh, the sediment flux coming out from the range of southern New Zealand, it was also possible to estimate the erosional flux, which is estimated around 700 or so billions uh, kilo per year. So in that case, it seems that the southern New Zealand is uh, at steady state in the sense, as previously shown, that all the material coming from tectonics is eroded, stripped away, and we get some stable situation without lateral spreading. So the questions, so to come back to the issue about uh, quantifying erosion processes. So the question is to know how we can shift from one situation 
orogenic plateau growing and lateral splitting, and when we stay in the uh, belt of the uh, stable uh, geometry of the uh, mountain range. And one probably important point is to know when the erosion is becoming enough efficient to remove the material. And the erosion efficiency, uh, as we will see, is depending on slope, elevation, and it's depending also on erodibility of the material and on precipitation rainfall. So if the precipitation is high uh, or the material is highly erodible, then with an elevation of two or three kilometers, you can get enough potential energy uh, of, uh, for the rain to erode everything. So we'll get, you will get some uh, efficient erosion of the mountain range and the capacity to stabilize it. In contrast, if you have, uh, oh sorry, I made a mistake. So if you have low air precipitation and low erodibility, then you will need to have a very high topography in order to have very steep slopes in order to be able to uh, erode quickly the, the, the material. And if the equilibrium topography for, to, to be able to remove that flux is above four or five kilometer, like six kilometer, then it's an elevation much higher than the mechanical stability elevation that the mountain range can sustain. So in that case, probably you will never reach uh, this equilibrium and you will, will reach the mechanical stability that makes the range will spread out laterally before reaching the topography sufficient to, uh, to have enough erosion. So it's very schematic, but I want to uh, point out the fact that depending on the erodibility, depending on the precipitation and depending mostly on the erosional processes behind it, we, we can achieve or not the equilibrium of the mountain range. So for that reason, it's very important to be able to quantify the sensitivity of erosion to topographic variable and also to uh, climatic variation to know when uh, you get er uh, the possibility to stabilize the mountain range and when you cannot. So in nature, we, we know that both situations can happen. So I just show you before the Southern uh, Alps where we get equilibrium. So when we get equilibrium, there is some uh, relationship between the elevation of the range and the reeds of the range. And when we get in the range of the, uh, on the domain of the uh, plateau and lateral splitting uh, uh, organic plateau, then we get some, some limitation of elevation around four, 5,000 meter and widths of the erosion that, that, that can be much larger than 200 kilometers. So we know from nature that Tibet, Altiplano, also probably the Anatoly, they are those kind of orogenic plateau for which erosion was not sufficient to uh, erode all the material coming from tectonics and was not able to prevent the uh, construction of this plateau. And in the green belt, in contrast, we can suppose either a very young Orogen, for which we don't know what will be the future evolution, or belt like the Southern uh, New Zealand Alps, for which the erosion was sufficiently efficient to be able to keep the mountain range in a narrow range. So still in uh, this issue of the mountain erosion, uh, mountain building uh, evolution, and in this question of the coupling between climate and tectonics. So I, I show you the feedbacks that has been explored by, uh, in particular, Rowe and Brandon in 2009. When uh, you build some topography, there is some effect on climate because of the orographic precipitation. So I show 
a view of the uh, Himalaya and Tibet. And you all know that because of these two features, and in particular because of the Himalayan uh, topographic barrier, then we get some concentration of the precipitation in, on the southern face of the Himalaya. In contrast, because of the inter interception of the moisture uh, by the Himalaya, north of the Himalayan in Tibet, it's much drier. So we can just see that the topography has a direct effect on the, uh, on the climate, uh, on the precipitation regime. So it introduced some kind of feedback of uh, topography on precipitation. So it's illustrated in, in this uh, diagram. So imagine uh, a range affected, for example, by uh, a period with wetter, uh, wetter climate and more precipitation. So you introduce more precipitation, so what, what's going on? If you have more precipitation in the range, so probably you will have more efficient erosion. If you have more erosion, then you remove more material and the mountain range will be slightly smaller and also slightly uh, uh, less wide or narrower. As a consequence of the narrowing and on the fact that the mountain range will be uh, lower in elevation, then the barrier or the orographic barrier to the preci precipitation will be less efficient. So there will be more moisture going through or above this topography and less precipitation on the, on the range. So it will introduce some feedback by the fact that the lower topography will lower the precipitation and by lowering the precipitation, you will lower the erosion and then the tectonics is gaining again and uh, uh, putting more flux and creating and coming back in some way to uh, the previous topography. You can imagine the reverse, a drier climate, so less precipitation, less erosion, the mountain range will grow more dramatically. It's higher, so it intercepts more moisture, so more rain. More rain means uh, more erosion and a narrowing or reverse uh, tendency for the mountain. So in some way, the coupling between uh, climate, topography, and tectonics makes that you have some feedback loops that can potentially stabilize the geometry of the range. So it's negative feedback that means that if you have some climatic perturbation, then the systems by itself will come back to some kind of equilibrium. So again, it's purely theoretical, and to be sure that this kind of loop do, does exist in reality or in nature, we need to be able to really uh, control the physics of the orographic precipitation, and also to understand the sensitivity of erosion to uh, precipitation and topographic variable. Another example of uh, this kind of retroaction, it's, uh, it was uh, um, studied by Beaumont and also by uh, Sean Willett in the early uh, 2000s. And they have been looking at uh, the distribution of precipitation. Does it make, well, the question was simple. Does it make a difference if the precipitation are asymmetrics? In the sense, uh, usually, for example, in the uh, in northern hemisphere, above uh, a latitude of 30, most of the moisture are coming from uh, west to the east. And in the intertropical zone, because of the trade winds, most of the moisture is going from uh, east to west. So when you have a range, a mountain range, you can get some kind of dominant uh, precipitation coming either from the uh, east to the west or dominant precipitation coming from the west to the east, depending on where you are. And again, for the tectonics, you can have some different situation. Sometimes the, the subductions 
is bringing material from east to west, and sometimes it's bringing uh, from west to east. So you can have different situation where you can have tectonics bringing this, uh, the material in the same direction as wind are br uh, bringing moisture, and in other case, it can be reverse. So the tectonic uh, is bringing material from west to east, mean, uh, whereas the wind uh, bringing moisture from west to from east to west. So the question where does it make a situation to have some kind of sim uh, asymmetric uh, situation? So they did some again thermomechanical modeling, and you can see you see the final uh, the strain rate. Uh, and you see different picture. So different picture in terms of strain rate and different picture in terms of uh, drainage divide. So you can see that when the moisture is coming from the right to the left, so you have a, west, a wet side and a dry side, and obviously on the wet side, the erosion is more efficient, so the drainage divide is pushed toward the west, and here, it's a reverse, the drainage divide is, is pushed toward the, the east or to the right. And the strain rate is quite different between these two situations. And it was proposed to explain, for example, or to see in nature difference between the Southern Alps, where you get a subduction and the material coming from the west, from the east to the west, and the moisture coming mostly from the west. Whereas in the Olympic mountains, so in North America, you have uh, Seattle here, and uh, this is uh, Washington State, and here Canada. So the, in the Olympic mountain, it's river situation. The Cascada, Cascadia uh, is built by the shortening due to subduction from west to east, and the moisture is coming also from west to east. And when you look, for example, at the exhumation, the elevation, and also the uh, metamorphic grade, you see relatively different uh, situation. For the southern New Zealand, you can see that you have a very narrow zone of uh, high exhumation, and uh, in terms of, I don't know if I have it in the previous slide, yeah, in terms of uh, uh, metamorphic units, they are all concentrated, concentrated uh, close to the Alpine fault, so a very narrow uh, metamorphic belt. In contrast, for the Olympic mountains, the uh, uh, metamorphic grades are much more, uh, uh, separated, uh, separated. So different situation in terms of uh, metamorphic grade and also different situation in terms of exhumation. In that case, the exhumation is on a wide zone. In that case, the high exhumation is a very, in a very narrow zone. So different, different situation probably due to different uh, versions of the tectonics relative to the uh, moisture uh, uh, direction. For the last uh, 20 years, so, sorry for that. So again, understanding all the evolution of the mountain, how they are sensitive to uh, the direction of uh, precipitations coming is uh, it's important to understand and to quantify uh, surface processes to be able to answer this kind of question and to say, oh, okay, in this kind of tectonic and climatic setting, we would expect this kind of evolution and uh, in other situations, we will uh, observe a different evolution of the mountain range in terms of elevation and mountain uh, metamorphic grades. For the past also 20 years, one uh, question has been uh, one of the important questions that the geomorphologist and the technician have been trying to uh, address was the question about the uh, 
recent uh, evolution of the denudation at Earth. As you know, the Pleistocene Quaternary period is um, characterized by two things. First thing, some kind of uh, colder temperature from three to uh, uh, present time, from three million years to present time, the weather has been getting colder and colder on average. And it's the second uh, important point, it's this climate is marked by increasing oscillation between glacial and interglacial. So the climate was becoming colder and at the same time much more erratic in the sense with larger variation between cold period and warmer or cooler or cooler uh, period. So some author, uh, I think in, for example, in Zhang and Molnar in 2000, uh, Faison, uh, in 2001, have proposed that this entry in the Pleistocene period with much more oscillating climate has been producing some destabilization of the uh, Earth's surface by producing more erosion and also during glacial time because of the high sheet where and the glacier, mountain glacier was much more ex, uh, ex, extended, there were more glacier erosion and the combination of the two made that erosion at the surface was, uh, was much more efficient in some way. And they have been invoking this kind of scenario to explain uh, the fact that in many basins, so onshore or offshore basin uh, at the Earth's surface, it has been shown that, or proposed, that the sedimentation rate has been increased. So I show here this uh, global oceanic sediment accumulation rate that show that between uh, six, eight million years and the recent period between two and present time, the accumulation or sedimentation rate have been increased by a factor of two. Over sedimentation curves. So here it's another estimate. Show again the same thing. A recent, so for the last four to two million years, very large increase of the sedimentation here, it's more like a factor three to four. And more sedimentation means probably more erosion. So you need a mechanism to explain why for the last two or four million years, there was much more erosion at the surface uh, compared to the previous period. So one mechanism is to say, okay, the erosion efficiency was becoming much higher because of this oscillation or because of the glacier erosion. So again, it's some kind of theoretical explanation, but without knowing exactly how the erosion is sensitive to climatic oscillation or how is it sensitive to glacier erosion, it's difficult to uh, ascertain this kind of hypothesis. So again, it's important to have a good quantification of the processes, of the erosion processes, to try to answer this kind of questions. So we know for some cases that erosion is sensitive to climate, positively sensitive to precipitation. So for example, if you move to the Cascadia Range, uh, let's, uh, so where is the topography? It's probably, this is the mean topography of the Cascadia range, maximum topography here, some kind of symmetrical range. But in terms of exhumation, if you look at the apparent erosion rate as defined by thermochronological studies, you can see a very asymmetrical situation. The western side of the range is affected by high erosion rate, well, relatively high erosion rate compared to the eastern side of the range. And if you compare with the precipitation regime, so the gray line, you can see that on the western side, you get high precipitation. And on the eastern side, 
because of the range, because of the rain shadow effect, the precipitations dropped dramatically. And the erosion rate in some way is mimicking the precipitation uh, curve. Where we get high precipitation, we get high denudation. So in some cases, or in some studies, or I would say in many studies, it has been shown that we can, get, we can observe this kind of correlation between high precip higher precipitation and higher erosion. Yeah. Uh, so the local relief, it's the black curve. And in fact, uh, so basically the erosion, uh, yeah, the erosion is sensitive to uh, topography. So local relief, slopes and is sensitive to uh, precipitation through uh, discharge for the river. So it's depending on these two variables. So it can be that uh, if you want for a given range to increase uh, erosion, you can either increase the topographic relief or increase the precipitation. In that case, it seems that the, uh, the main uh, variable but changing its precipitation. So here, keeping the same topography on both sides, you are able to increase the erosion rate on the western side just by increasing the or touching the precipitation variable. I'm assuming that if there is higher erosion, then the relief should be higher or isn't it so? No, not necessary. I mean, uh, if uh, the relief, again, is a, uh, oh, okay. if you have a river like that with some steepness or with some slope, then if the deep charge, if you increase the deep charge by, let's say, a factor three, then the erosion efficiency will be higher. So in some way, you would expect where you get high precipitation, you will expect lower relief than where you have low precipitation, okay? So if you don't, if the Tectonics is the same everywhere. But by this kind of feedback, a loop between erosion and tectonics, where you will get more erosion, you will get more uplift. So if you have more uplift, then the river is going to steepen again. So for this situation, You can have exactly the same river slope, the same relief, but in one case, uh, here you will have erosion three times, let's say three times higher, at equilibrium with an uplift three times higher than here. So here you have So you can have exactly the same topography, but affected by higher uplift and erosion on the western side and eastern side. So here, the topography is more or less the same on both sides, but the erosion and the precipitation are three times higher on the left side than on the right side. Okay, but it's, I confess it's, it's not obvious 
why it's not obvious, just because of this feedback. And because also it's not possible of, because of this feedback to uh, separate the effect of um, topographic variable and climatic variable. So we can, yeah. So can we say that if we are getting higher relief in, and higher erosion, so uh, that, uh, I mean, in that scenario, we can say that tectonically the area is, I mean, highly active. And if we get low relief, higher erosion, then we can say that the area is uh, tectonically not active. Can we say that? Uh, I'm not sure to, uh, to, uh, to have understood your questions. Sorry. I mean, if we are getting, in, uh, suppose in any study area, if we are getting higher relief, and higher erosion also, we have to this. So on the basis of these two parameters, can we assume that area is tectonically active? And in some other study area, if we are getting a similar kind of higher erosion, but low relief. So can we say that the area is I mean, not active? Like, uh, no, no, I want no, to no, give no, an example. A, no, because it's, well, uh, I will show you uh, in the next uh, days, a few, a few examples, but uh, for the moment, I just spoke about um, variable like uh, topographic variable through the slope of the river and also climatic variable. And I didn't speak about erodibility for the moment, but we will see, for example, then uh, in a place called the Shiwalix, so the frontal Himalaya, uh, you are exhuming um, sandstone, which are relatively uh, poorly cemented sandstones, and you can get relief ridiculous. I mean, uh, one, 200 meter relief, uh, and still have uh, uh, 10 millimeter per year of uplift, so very active. One of the place uh, on Earth where uplift rate is the highest, but relief is just low because it's so easy for the river to remove that material, but uh, uh, you don't create a relief. And at the opposite, uh, there are places, uh, I would say, um, I don't know if you are familiar with that, but uh, uh, in uh, uh, Guyana Shields, in Venezuela, or in uh, northern Brazil, you have this plateau of quartzite, which are 1,000 to 2,000 meter high, called the Tepui. So it's a cliff, 1,000 meter relatively steep, uh, or it's vertical. You have a, a, a relief of at least 1,000 meter, and it has been inactive for hundreds, million years. So uh, relief in itself, it's not sufficient. It's depending on precipitation, depending also on the strongly on light energy. It's part of the equation, but it cannot be considered independently of the other variables. Okay, so locally, excuse sir. people. Sir, I have a question. Oh, yeah. sorry. So in the previous diagram, can you please go, go back? So up to first 125 kilometers, the mean uh, local relief is higher than elevation. So how is that possible? I mean, the local relief is a, uh, it's, I, well, I don't remember uh, in this study how it, was, it is calculated. So it can be on a small basin taking the, sm the lowest point and the highest point and making the difference. So, or it can be calculated also by taking some sliding window so you consider a window, for example, a radius uh, of five kilometer. And in this zone, you will try to find the lowest point and the highest point, and again, measure the difference. So what, what is, is impossible, it's to have this curve, the relief, higher 
than the maximum topography, the crest. So this is impossible, you are right. But for the mean topography, it's not a problem because mean it's, uh, I mean, with the relief we are looking at the maximum minus the minimum uh, elevation. So if the minimum elevation of the river in that area it's close to sea level, then maybe the relief will be very close to the maximum elevation of the crest and it can be, it can be higher than the mean elevation. Does it answer your question? Yes. So there are a local uh, study where people seem to see some uh, relation between precipitation and uh, exhumation rate. And, but when we try to look at more, uh, at a more global view, comparing as did uh, Summerfield and Ulton at different big basin in the world, and they try to separate and uh, tectonics and climatic effect and to see, or topographic and climatic effect to see if they can see uh, uh, some variable which dominates the erosion. In fact, as I was explaining before, before all the variables are interacting, it's difficult to uh, get some uh, clear results. So obviously, we see some tendency. So the tendency, it's on general, denudation is related to relief or to topographic variable. So the highest the mountain is, usually the highest the erosion will be. And for discharge, uh, when we try just to isolate this variable, then the, uh, it's the correlation is much, much lower, around 0 0.5 for discharge, and again, on general, when you get more precipitation and more river discharge, you get higher erosion. But it's, again, it's not systematic, just because tectonics and also lithology variable are uh, coming in the play, in the, in the game, and it's difficult to uh, separate the effect of the different variables. Uh, another point uh, for which uh, we are interested by uh, studying surface processes and quantifying surface processes. For landscape, like probably for the Southern Alps of New Zealand, uh, for landscape at steady state, it means the geometry of the range is uh, remaining stable on time. It means that uh, the erosion is able to equate the uplift. So in that case, erosion rate is equal to uplift rate. And if erosion is depending on variable like climatic variable, but also on topographic variable, so you would expect when, for example, some landscape is present a low relief and it's not very steep to have low erosion rate and when it is steep to have higher erosion rate. So if looking, if you uh, are able to link or to relate the erosion rate to the topographic uh, characteristic, the steepness of the topography or the steepness of the river, we will see it later, then if you are able to measure uh, erosion rate from the uh, landscape characteristic, then you can get an idea about uplift rate. And we'll see that uplift rate, in particular on a long-term scale, it's not a very easy variable that can be measured. So most of the time, we measure erosion instead of measuring uplift and making the assumption that erosion is equal to uplift. So uh, knowing or understanding the uh, sensitivity of erosion to a uh, landscape uh, characteristic geometry we will get some kind of dynamic marker of the uh, vertical deformation. I will show you an example uh, later, or for example here. So this map, you see in the uh, white lines, this is a fluvial network. So the fluvial network in the San Gabriel Mountains, 
So it's, it's a place, a small mountain built by a bend on the uh, San Andreas Fault and north of the Los Angeles uh, Basin. And this map represents represent in some way the steepness of the rivers. So in that place in uh, purple colors, there are place where places where the river are relatively steep and in the western part, the river at much less steep. And calculating uh, some kind of uh, fluvial shear stress, so I will uh, explain you this variable later, uh, we can estimate in some way the capacity of incision, of bedrock incision of the rivers. And you see that in that area and in that area we have higher probably erosion rate, which is confirmed by a more recent um, estimate of erosion rate on a, uh, some basin measured by uh, cosmogenic nuclides. So I will explain again the method in the, uh, on the day number three. Uh, but for the moment, it's just uh, a matter of uh, explaining the fact that if you are able to document the place where you have high erosion rate, probably if the topography is in dynamic equilibrium or at steady state, you have a view of the uplift map. And it gives you an idea of the active faults. So in particular, particularly the active fault here. So this one, for example, is the Cucamonga first fault. So we can presume that this first fault is much more active than, for example, this first fault, which is uh, uh, bonding a place where erosion rate and probably a uplift rate are lower. So if the notion of steady state topography works, I'm not sure it is the case here, but having a good documentation of the erosion rate, we can have a view, a window, on the uplift rate of the upper crest and document, for example, the activity of the faults. So, yeah? Oh, it's same. It's same? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, I will... Uh, uh, you have used these two term in your sentence, so... Like first you said dynamically equilibrium to topography, then you said steady, steady state. state. So it's yeah. the same or? Yeah, it is the same. At, uh, topography or at equilibrium or at steady state uh, means, uh, means the same, yeah. Um, so, uh, so in case of uh, absence of any sedimentary archive, yeah. uh, how do we estimate a topography uh, which is in steady state topography and a topography which is not in steady state topography in a time scale of le let's say 500 uh, 5 million years yeah it's a it's a good and tough question because uh, most of the time uh, people just do guess about the fact so we are uh, we Theoretically, we can never, it's very hard to, uh, or in practice, I mean, it's very hard to, uh, to demonstrate that a topography is at equilibrium. And even it's at equilibrium, or at steady state like the New Zealand, just by comparing the uh, material flux and the erosive flux, it's just some st steady state at wide scale. We don't know, probably locally, close to the drainage divide, you will have some kind of at these equilibrium features, but at wide scale, we can consider some kind of steady state. In many range, uh, if we don't have an estimate either on the tectonic flux or on the sedimentation flux, yeah, it's difficult to uh, uh, consider that uh, the topography is uh, at steady state or not. There are uh, a few features uh, among them, it's uh, to look if the topography, uh, the river, for example, is um, having some uh, normal concavity.
So if, for example, a topography is a growing topography and it's gaining in elevation, river profile can show this kind of feature. So you will have some uh, relict of initial plat uh, flat surface that becomes small, small plateau. And in terms of river profile, you can have this kind of uh, feature with some relict, uh, relict uh, low uh, steepness uh, river. In a, in a river, in a fully equilibrated uh, mountain, so the normal, oh, it's a back, a blue one. You will expect the normal uh, profile to have a continuous or a homogeneous uniform concavity. So if all the rivers in, the monta in your mountains uh, have normal concavities, so it's one, it's not a definitive, but it's at least a necessary condition to say, oh, probably uh, the topography is close to the equilibrium. If you have this kind of feature, yeah, it's a sign that the, uh, your topography is not at equilibrium. But again, it's, it's difficult to, to give a, a very definitive answer because there are so many case study or, uh, in, in nature and it's this kind of arguments holds only if you have very homogeneous uplift. If the uplift is uh, slightly more complex with uh, interbasin range or things like that, it's, you can have some particularities. But yeah, usually it's one of the arguments uh, considered to answer these questions. Uh, yeah, thank you. So in this case, uh, uh, what is the basis of assuming that this topography is steady state topography and then interpreting the uh, data? Oh, it's, uh, in, in that case, so in this study, uh, I didn't, uh, I don't remember, but uh, I didn't uh, discuss so much the issue of uh, directly interpreting this map of incision in terms of uplift. So it was most uh, presenting, uh, the idea was more to uh, explain how this kind of map can potentially be used uh, to uh, gain information on uh, uplift rate. Uh, so in, in this study, uh, we were more interested in uh, comparing a short-term erosion to long-term erosion. So there are several kinds of uh, uh, erosion estimate, thermochronology for long terms, um, uh, river network geometry uh, at intermediate scale, and there were also estimate from uh, cosmogenic or sediment flux in debris basin for short term. So it was more a question to look at the uh, erosion at different time scale. So it's also one way to respond to your answer. It means that if your topography is uh, at steady state, you would expect the, uh, the erosion rate to be continuous on time. So to have a, a short term or intermediate uh, uh, estimate of erosion rate uh, at time scale, intermediate time scale to be equal to the long term uh, erosion given, for example, for, for, by pharmacology. If there is some uh, uh, topography in disequilibrium, it means a growing topography or a warning topography, then the uh, modern or recent uh, erosion will be higher or lower than the long term uh, erosion. In that case, as far as I remember, uh, there were, uh, it was relatively difficult to assume, uh, to uh, calculate the long-term denudation rate because the pharmacology, uh, uh, there were efficient track in appetite. They were not fully reset. The exhumation was not sufficient, less than three kilometer, to be able to really calculate the uh, denudation rate in that part. So from this point, it's difficult to say if it's at equilibrium or not. If I consider the uh, issue of the 
concavity of the river. Uh, I think in all that part, the there is no really uh, small plateau, and most of the concavity are relatively uh, uh, regular. So I would say that in that part, yeah, the, probably the topography is close to some kind of equilibrium. Thank you. So I've shown you an example where we have uh, active tectonics. So uh, uplift rate is around millimeter per year. So the landscape as uh, can, uh, well, if you have uplift rate of, let's say, one millimeter per year, and the equilibrium topography is around two kilometer, then in two million years, two or three million years, then you are able, in theory, to reach this kind of uh, equilibrium. But in other cases, uh, the erosion is much lower, in particularly in a, a non-tectonic area. And uh, in that case, uh, the river profile cannot be this, uh, uh, can have preserved in some way the very long-term uh, uplift history uh, or regional history of a region. So this is the hypothesis made, for example, by Robertson White in 2010 uh, to try to explain. So we are in Africa, and this is uh, Angola, and there is a plateau in Angola with uh, several rivers. And if we look at those rivers, you see, as I was uh, showing you uh, previously, uh, they are not, it's not a normal, uniform con uh, concavity, but there are a series of what we call nick points, in particularly here, here, and here, and also here. And this nick point in non-tectonic area can be the trace of past, uh, uh, past event of regional uplift rate. And this is the uh, hypothesis made by this author, and using and I will see it uh, later in this class today, using the steepness of this nick point and the distance between the nick points and the base level of the, the, the sea points, uh, they, are able, they were able to reconstruct in some way the regional uplift rate. And for the three rivers, they get some kind of uh, relatively uh, consistent result. I mean, two parts of incision rate affected by this region, one first between 30 and 20 million years, and another one more recent between 10 million years and zero that culminated around five to 10 million years ago. So to be able to explain the specific shape with several nick points of this river, they introduced the idea that the region has been uplifted, then some quiet, uh, period and then again uplifted and some quiet period. So in that case, the river topography is not used to infer the instantaneous uplift rate, but in this kind of disequilibrium landscape, we can use the geometry of the surface or the, um, the geometry of the river to infer the long-term uplift history of, uh, of a given area. Last point, societal issue, both understanding what's uh, provoke the landslide and economic uh, issue with uh, all the uh, all processes and, and also sun fabrics and, and so and so. So now I have uh, finished in some way with uh, uh, trying to convince you that uh, quantifying uh, erosion rate is relatively important for many different aspects and many different aspects that can uh, interest sedimentologists, technicians, geomorphologists, but also uh, uh, applied uh, uh, geologists. And uh, now we are going to move to uh, the more uh, physical erosion and trying to understand if we can go into
quantitative description of the different phenomena. So the physical erosion of landscape is driven by several, uh, several uh, processes and the different processes are applying in different parts of the landscape. So in the highest part of the mountain, we'll get some glacial erosion and periglacial processes. On the hill slope, we'll get a different kind of processes. Surface uh, superficial erosion, deep-seated erosion with deep-seated landslide. And in the valley, obviously, we'll get the fluvial network. And the fluvial at the level of fluvial network, we'll get fluvial sediment transport, transport and we'll get also a fluvial erosion of the bedrock substratum. So today, I will speak and I will present mostly uh, bedrock erosion by rivers. So why? Why beginning by this, by the river? There, I consider that there are three reasons to uh, study river in priority. Um, first reason, the river network in terms of surface is representing less than 5% of the, if you consider a map, and if you consider the surface occupied by the fluvial network, it's less than 5% of the surface of your map. So you, can, you, you, you could consider, okay, it's a minor actor because it's not uh, uh, representing most of the map. But in fact, even if it's representing less than 5%, it has a dominant role in erosion, at least because it represents the base level of landslide, uh, of hill slope. It means that if you consider some hill slope, so a river, the hill slope, how do you destabilize your hill slope? Well, you can have strong rain, you can have also earthquakes, but if you have river incision, then you steepen your hill slope. And by steepening your hill slope, this is the basic uh, process that makes the hill slope to become unstable and to increase the erosion, in particular by deep-seated landslide. So you can see definitively but that the river incision is controlling the base level of the hill slope, and in some way, the basic, the river incision is dictating the velocity at which the hill slope will be degrading or denudating. So for that reason, I consider that a uh, river in, in, in some way is uh, uh, the main actor of the uh, landscape erosion. Second reason, if you are interested by the uh, mean, uh, the relief, the total relief of uh, a mountain range, or if you're interested by the mean elevation of a mountain range, then looking at the, uh, what we call the relief, we can uh, split the relief in two components. One we will call, call the fluvial relief, which is the difference between the elevation of a source and the uh, elevation of the river outlet. And the total relief is the sum of the fluvial relief plus the hill slope relief. And in fact, in many mountain uh, uh, landscape, you can figure out that good parts, like 70, 80% of the total relief of the mountain is, uh, is done, or it's old, is old by the fluvial relief. So you can see here the outlet, the source, the head source, water head source, and you can see that you have like, let's say three kilometers of relief plus only 500 meters of relief associated to hill slope. 
So if you want to understand the mean elevation of the range or the maximum elevation of the range, basically the most important things is the relief uh, provided by the fluvial relief. It means by the fluvial network. So the fluvial network, it's like uh, the, I'm, I don't know how to say that in English, the, the skeletons in some way of the, of the landscape. And the, the hill slope will be just the flesh on top of the skeleton. Third reason to uh, study rivers. Uh, if we are interested in the dynamic marker of the uh, uplift, so to uh, use uh, the geometry of the landscape uh, or some feature of the landscape to understand the underlying uh, uplift rate, then if we compare hill slope and river, we, sh we, we see that if you consider hill slope, there is some kind of limitation that call the limit uh, induced by uh, slope stability or induced by landsliding. So for erosion rate and uplift rate higher than 0 0.3, 0 0.5 millimeter per year, then all the slopes becomes close to 30, 35 degrees. So if you go to in some mountain and you say, oh, okay, the slope is at 30, 35 degrees on average, you are not able to say, oh, the uh, erosion rate is 0 0.5 or the erosion rate is three millimeter per year. So this kind of situation makes the uh, hill slope angle uh, uninteresting in some way to decipher the erosion underlying uh, uplift rate and the erosion rate of the region. In contrast, if you compare the uh, incision rate and some variable here linked to the topographic slope, you see that the higher the slope, the higher the incision rate. So we don't observe this kind of limitation. It's so for that reason, we can use river topography as a marker of erosion and uh, uplift rate more easily or more, uh, with more sensitivity than in slope. So let's first consider uh, river processes. So do you make a break at, uh, okay. Yeah. Race hill slope. Uh, yeah. What is the way to uh, estimate hill slope relief at uh, a point? Usually in most studies, people are not uh, are just interested by, or they are just measuring the uh, local relief, as I uh, mentioned earlier, by taking some sliding windows. So they just measure, uh, measure the difference between lowest point and the highest point without making the difference what is uh, held by uh, hill slope and what is held by rivers. But uh, if you would uh, like to, to, to make the, this measure, then you can do it at the scale of the basin. So for a given basin, you will consider the uh, fluvial relief as the difference between either the highest source or you consider the mean elevation of all the, the source of your network and you make the difference between for example, the highest source and the outlet of the river. And for the hill slope, uh, you can consider the average elevation between the crest and the closest uh, uh, source of the closest uh, stream. So in that case, it will be a difference between this point and this point and between this point and this point. And then you can make some average for all the uh, crest points. So, it, so 
this is the difference between the highest point and the point in the tributary of the mainstream. You mean to say that? S sorry. See, hill slope relief is the difference between the highest point and the lowest point in the one of the tributary of the mainstream. Is it? You, you? I, I'm not sure if the the microphone is uh, working the, correctly. The, the line, the point that you have shown, uh -huh. the for hill slope relief estimate, that line that you have joined in the tributary. Yeah. It is, is it, what is that, gully or tributary, what is that? This line? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, this. Oh, it's, uh, so it, if we look in cross section, so that will be, oh, it's, a view from the side, that will be the crest, and that will be, so maybe I can do it in blue, so this is the river network. Okay, and this is the river network, so this is the elevation and so the relief of the hill slope will be the elevation of the crest minus the elevation of the river. So my, my line was more or less the following the steepest slope of the, the steepest descent will go from the crest to the, uh, to the place where the, uh, the water is arriving uh, in the uh, river network, and we will consider the difference of elevation between the crest and this point. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sir, the point at the lowest elevation, that will be the, uh, the stream closest to that crest, or it, will be, or it could be to the main channel as well. Uh, you dropped a no, perpendicular the from channel. the crest. The, 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 not the main channel, just the beginning of the of the first, the the closest, the closest uh, uh, point of the stream network. Thank you, sir. Yes. Sir, can you please go to the previous presentation where you have explained that erosive and non-erosive models by Bument et al. I mean, to the previous presentation. Sir. Uh, mm, some more back. Where you have explained models. Yeah. I want to understand the first model where erosion and uh, erosive and non-erosive -eros process are controlling mountain. I mean, how they are controlling mountain building. Some more. This one. So, uh, can you please explain it once more? I mean. Actually, I want to understand if, if there is any difference in the subsurface geometry also while we consider erosive and non-erosive case. The, yeah, there is a difference because, uh, because tectonics uh, or because deformation is uh, uh, sensitive to a, a stress distribution, okay? And Stress distribution, in particular vertical stress, is sensitive to topography. So if you have, if you begin to thicken your crust and have a small plateau like here, then the topography here is more maybe four kilometers above the uh, adjacent point. And because of the high topography, then, the vert if you compare a point here and a point here at the same elevation, the vertical stress will be higher here than here. Because here you have five kilometers of crest uh, 
above the point, and here on only one kilometer. So you're in a situation So if you have some regional compression, so you will have a, some horizontal stress like here, same like here, and here you have, let's say, a vertical stress like here, and here because of the higher, top, higher topography, the vertical stress was like that. So you see that here, sigma one are the most uh, important uh, stress um, component is the horizontal one. So it will favor thickening and thrusting. In contrast, here, if the vertical stress is higher than the horizontal stress, then you are favoring uh, thinning and even almost normal faulting. So all that to explain that because of this different stress regime, in that part, it becomes much more difficult to thicken. You are favoring thinning rather than thickening. In contrast, on the uh, lateral side, you are, are favoring thickening. So it's what the consequence well, let's say we keep the same elevation because we are unable to thicken in that part, but we thicken in that part. And it can be the same on the other side. So what happens? It's just lateral splitting, spreading, and or growing, a lateral growing of your mountain range. So having this very basic idea in mind, now if you add the erosion, what's going on? You remove all that material. So if you remove all that crust, maintaining an elevation close to zero, then the vertical stress is the same as here. So now you can have thrust fault and thickening, or trying to have thickening in that part, but mostly thrust fault. So the main difference is without erosion, you can see this is the final, uh, final strain. So you have uh, deformed, all over the range, but the uh, uh, instantaneous strain rate, you can see that you activated uh, mostly a thrust fault at the outside of the range, not in the internal part because the vertical stress is too high, but on the side of the range. And here, because there is, uh, the vertical stress is not high in the center because there is no topography, you can maintain active thrust fault uh, on a very narrow uh, range. So this is the main difference. This is the main point. It's erosion by removing material. It's changing the stress state in the whole upper crust and modifying the stress state. It's modified the strain uh, and the, the, the instantaneous and finite deformation. Okay? It's up to you. Yeah. Okay. Slide. Uh, actually, I did not follow completely that slide. There, you're trying to explain uh, using river profile, you, I think, uh, estimating the uplift. Uh, could you please explain again? This slide I, could, I did not follow. I, well, I can show you slightly in advance. I, I guess this, that slide is trying to explain that uh, using river profile, we are estimating uplift. Yeah, uh, where are you at?
I will explain it later, but we, we, we can begin with that. Uh, imagine that you have a river uh, at equilibrium with an uplift rate of, let's say, one millimeter per year. And at some time, the tectonic activity increases, and the uplift rate is multiplied by three. What's going on? The river is going to adapt to this new uplift rate, and you will see some nick point, some, some steeper uh, uh, part of the river, uh, rising and propagating like a wave toward the headwater. So I will, I think I have a movie. So you see the response. So you see it's propagating that way. So after, so after a few million years, then the river has fully equilibrated with a new uplift rate. But if you consider that uh, the response time of the river is very long, maybe you will be in some, some kind of trans, transient uh, situation where you have still the nick point here and the upper part of the river is still uh, maintaining the former geometry. It's like the information that the new uplift rate has arrived in the region has reached all the downstream part, but not yet the upstream part. So it's just based on this uh, ID. So, uh, yeah, you can see the propagation of the nick points along the main river, but it's the same along the tributaries. Where is it? Okay. So imagine now that the history of the uplift is rather complex in some region. I imagine that in a region is affected by an uplift of 0.1 millimeter per year. And after some times it jumped to 0.2 and after two, uh, 0 0.2 million years it jumped to 0.6 and then go down and up and down. So what's going on? So at the beginning you have some kind of equilibrium river. So the movie quality is not very good, but I will hope you will follow it. So you see the profile is, whoops. So you see that the final profile is affected by different nick point. And this different nick point, it just the information of the variable uplift rate, which is propagating upward or uh, in upstream direction. So if you see at the local slope of the river, you see this shape of the local slope and you can see uh, some kind of signal which is mimicking the initial uplift rate. So in that case, you see that the first increase or sharp increase of uplift rate has been propagating uh, almost 200 kilometers far upstream, and we can find some disturbed slope close to the, to the source. In contrast, the second pulse of uplift, because it arrives later, it had no time to propagate uh, so far, so you can find this the remnant or the, the disturbance created by this increased uplift uh, only around 100 kilometers from the, from the uh, outlet of the river. So it's typically the shape of the river which is out of equilibrium and which has preserved the information of the past uplift. So it's basically the model, model behind uh, what is uh, used by uh, uh, Roberts and White. They consider that each nick point, each steeper part of the, uh, 
river here and here in some way informative of the past uplift. And if you have a well quantified incision model, then you can use the steepness and the distance of the nick point between uh, the uh, outlet of the river and, uh, and the nick point to get an idea of the, when the perturbation in terms of uplift occurred in the history of the river. Is it clearer? No? Yeah, it, it's clear. So uh, to arrive this conclusion, I think we, uh, they must have uh, neglected the effect of uh, differential erosion because of lithology. Is neglected which, which effect? You uh, so the, uh, var uh, the variation of uh, variation in the long duration profile of a river uh -huh. that we have seen could be because of not because of upliftment. The other. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. How, so how they have uh, uh, how they have find the evidences of the other part? It's uh, I would say it's uh, they work. They have been doing this kind of work. Uh, the, the group of Nicky White in, uh, in Cambridge, they have been uh, doing this kind of work in the Africa first, then in Madagascar. They applied it also to Australia and probably to some other part. I'm not very uh, familiar with all their work. And in some ways, it's, it's remaining controversial because obviously, you could, you could uh, and it will be the exercise uh, or the tutorial of uh, this afternoon, but. Uh, you can also explain this kind of discontinuity or, in the, or nick point by some other uh, explanation like lithology. Maybe here it corresponds to very hard rock and here it corresponds to a soft rock. Uh, you could imagine that also, well, it's probably not the case, but you could imagine also that the nick point corresponds to some part where here there is some tectonic activity so the river is responding to present tectonic activity, not past one, and here it's not active. So there are many explanations possible when you see just the uh, geometry of the uh, profile. And according to what you know about lithology, climate, and uh, activity or not activity of the, mulch, uh, of, the, of the fault in the region, you can go toward one interpretation or toward another interpretation. And uh, again, it's in this study, at least I, I'm not sure about the last one they have, de have done, but in the earlier study, study they have been uh, doing in this group, they were considering homogeneous climate and homogeneous lithology. Obviously, at the, at the scale of this region, it's not, it's not true. But they were doing the main assumption that the lithology has a minor role in the, in the incision and the first role was given to uh, river steepness and tectonics. But you are right. I mean, it's, uh, we could imagine a different uh, scenario, uh, which is, well, there is one point relatively puzzling in some way. It's in the three rivers, one, two, three, they got more or less the same history from the profile. So. If it will be, for example, a uh, lithologic nick point, it will be some kind of uh, uh, a big hazard to, to get uh, the uh, location of the nick point exactly at the good place in order to derive the same uplift history. But uh, yeah, it's something we need to be slightly more uh, uh, investigating details. Thank you.